scary boy. Uh, hey, uh, thank you again uh, for attending the Zoom meetup. And uh, I'll ask Robert to start us off with um, talking about building multi targeted plugins for Umbraco 8 and 9. Robert. Alrighty. Okay, sharing screens. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, basically, um, remoting into another computer at the moment. So, um, geez, I've got a lot of junk on my screen. Let's close all that down. Okay. Well, tell me, can you see the Windows environment now? Is that a yes? Yeah. Uh, dashboard controller. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Now, I'll just minimize the little talking heads box. Get that out of my way. Um, all right. So, basically, what we're looking at is we're going to look at how we migrate or multi target. A, an existing Umbraco 8 plugin to be able to support both Umbraco 8 and Umbraco 9. So what I've done in the last, literally in the last hour, I've built this tiny little plugin. It's all it is is a dashboard, and um, it has um, the ability to call back to the server, and you can see the current time updating there. So um, in this very minimal application, I've got a dashboard controller here and I've got a composer here, which calls this register server variables. And what register, tell me if this is too small, by the way, do I need to increase the font size? No, okay. no? Great. So this uh, register server variables simply um, creates a a, a variable on the um, Umbraco URLs, which is used client side to be able to get to certain services. Um, and so this is something I do standard in most of my plugins where I need to call back to a controller from the Angular JS or something like that. Uh, so what it's doing here is we have this method on URL helper called get Umbraco API service base URL and you pass it's a generic method with the controller that you want to be able to access. And um, then in the um, method parameter here, you've got a call back to call one of the controller prop, um, methods. In this case, it's just get status. So that's enough to actually register this custom variable here with this collection of variables. And then on the um, back end side, I'll just get rid of all these bits in my resource here. I've got this same variable name here, and that's the method call that I want to play. So rather than having to hard code your URLs or, or place them at the root, and you don't have to worry about any of that if you just use register, um, get your base uh, URLs and things like that and register them with Umbraco URLs. Um, so anyway, that's basically the gist of it. Um, there's not much more to it. I've got a model here called dashboard data, which gives a couple of things. Um, in the very short time that I did, I didn't quite get it retrieving the actual currently logged in user's name. So not worrying about that, but we can prove that we're actually calling back to the server. Um, if we set our breakpoint, which I'm not gonna do since we've got a short time and we just refresh the page, it's always gonna come back with a different time. Um, so there we go. Anyway, so that's that. So now my challenge is how am I going to make this work with Umbraco 9 as well? So what we're going to do is we're going to add to this solution and we're going to create a new, add a new project. If I can remember how to do this, add, I'm not running it, no, good, new project. And I've already installed the Umbraco 9 templates using .NET um, install on the command line. I could use the command line for this, but this is fine as well. So I've got this Umbraco package and I've got an Umbraco project. I'm going to choose package. And I'm going to call it target demo 2. And then we say, so, yep, we'll go and and um, .NET 6 should be all right. And it's gone and created, we'll just close that one and minimize this. So it's given us this minimal 
um, project here. So out of the box, you get this build targets and you get app plugins like this. So I'm gonna basically merge these two together. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to rename, I'm gonna copy some stuff up into this main one because there's no point going back the other way. And uh, package manifest is fine. We don't need that, we don't need that. But we're gonna modify our targets here to point at the appropriate plug app plugins directory. So in this case, it's at plugins, multi-target demos, we'll take the two out. And that should be enough. I know we need, well, this is just kind of messages, so we don't really need to worry about that too much. Um, but um, we might just do a quick search and replace. We'll just do, Demo two and change that all to demo. Okay, so that's enough to get that in place. And we can now just pretty much close that and forget it. I can find the right, so there we go. All right, so to make this work, we actually need to do multi-targeting in the in the project file. So I'm going to close, unload it, save everything. I'm going to go and um, edit project file. And we've got a few changes we need to make. In fact, we've got a lot of changes we need to make. So this was a, a um, .NET framework um, project originally. And you can see it's got all these bits and pieces in here. Um, but if we look at this one, it's a lot simpler. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this and we're going to transpose it over. So I'm going to effectively wipe out most of this because with the new code, it doesn't matter. Now, the big difference here is instead of target framework, you need to pluralize that. And then you can do, um, I think it's .NET 4.7 or something like that, 472, I think it is. Let me just check that in another project that I've got sitting here handily in the background, just in case I need it. Um, and it's net, no, close, almost had it. Okay, and that needs to be a semicolon like that. All right, and we're gonna rename this. To dot plugin, because that's the name of the project. Description, yeah, it's got a dot, dot, dot. We'll just leave those alone. Um, root namespace, again, that. Um, Umbra Go 8, Umbra Go 9, just kind of bootstrapping stuff. All right, now when we get to these, package references, we need to be able to target two sets of package references, one for Umbrico 8 and one for Umbrico 9. So in this item group, we need to modify those as well. And again, I'm going to back to my old project, which I've already done this for. And you'll see that I've done a few things here. So I've got um, these property groups with con conditions, and they're basically using looking at the target framework and the platform. So this one's debug net 5.0 any CPU. This one's down here is uh, debug net 4.472 any CPU. There should also be, with any luck, a list of um, NuGet package references as well, which is what these ones here are. So this is the 472 package references. So I'm gonna copy that. Um, and I'm going to also, eh, well, they could be combined, but I don't worry about that at the moment. I'll copy that over. So that replaces this. And the other one is this one here for the .NET 6. So I'll update those in a sec. 
Actually, what I might do is change this all back to no, uh, net five. Oh, that's the wrong one. Let's close that one. This one. And I'll set this to net five just to make sure that we're not going to blow up somehow. All right. So that basically, if I come back, oh, the other thing I need to do is get these targets in. So I'll copy these in. Okay. So if I reload this, reload, we should now see under our dependencies, we've got two sets, one for net 472, one for net 5.0. If we look at our packages, this one's umbraco.cms.web 9.0.0. This one is umbraco.cms.core 4.6.0. So effectively, that's the starting point of everything. So our challenge is now we can leave our app plugins directory alone. Nothing really changes in there. Nothing changes in our build. We have some changes to make in our composer. You'll notice also we have this switcher here, which allows us to switch between the two target frameworks. And we can see that um, looking at this, um, for currently for net 5.0, these two are not supported. They're not found and the whole lot is just not working. But if we switch to 472, all of a sudden it comes back alive. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some if statements around. And, and we've well, got these snippets going. So this is our composer one. So I'm just going to copy this bit in. OK. so. This basically tells us which blocker code we're going to use depending on which framework. So if we're going net 5.0 or greater, then we use this one. Otherwise, we're using that. Then we can prove that by switching between like this. Um, call notifications. Doesn't seem to be found. I might be missing a reference somewhere. I'll fix that up. So now we've got these right, but this is still broken. So Umbraco 9 uses things a little differently. And I'll just get rid of my sidebar here, move this over. And we will make some changes to our composer. So Umbraco 9, I use a composer is deprecated to just I composer. It doesn't have a runtime level. So we're going to do this if net five, oops. 5.0 oh, or greater. And then we've got an else as well. Leave that alone. And we'll leave these two lines. And we're going to put in a public class composer. My composer. All right, so far so good. Now we actually have to implement that. So again, this also is different. So um, we could either just put that whole block up in there, or we can um, because you might have other variables. I tend to do this kind of thing instead. And another else statement, and then the end if. So, what we'll do is we'll just implement and we'll move that into the appropriate space. All right, well, we're getting there. So, there's a little bit more to do. So, we're now going to move this because the whole composition doesn't work outside of the old version. So, well, as it turns out, our whole method is going to inside, end up inside these blocks. Let's turn it up a bit. So here we have a builder and we're going to add, well, this is for notification handler and we're going to add a different 
bit of code to register our server variables, which I'll get to in a sec. Actually, we need something else here. Okay. Right. So we're going to have to get some, we've got this one here, which has popped up because I basically implemented an empty class so that we can have a look at it later. So we're now going to go ahead and implement that. Now, the reason we need to do this is because Umbraco 9 handles um, events completely different. There's no such thing as server variables parse or dot parsing as an event handler. Umbraco uses something more about, uh, it's more to do with um, message queues and things like that now. So we can't use pretty much most of this code is useless in Umbraco 9. So to that point, we're actually going to put uh, a block around this. We're actually going to change its name too because it makes it clear as to which version of Umbraco it relates to. And we're going to come and grab this block here. And at the very bottom, we'll put our end if. Now we need to negate this because it's only relevant to Umbraco 8. Is that the bell saying I've got running out of time? Yes, it is. <laughs> How much extra time do you want to give me? Uh, well, we can do another two minutes more. If, if, All right, yeah. I'll make it quick and dirty. Oops. There you go, auto implemented. <laughs> there we go, there's our, there's our replacement class for this. Um, better make sure that everything's in the right spot here. That's better. Okay, so effectively, the, this is the equivalent for the Umbra Code 9 version. Name it. And that handles that. The other bit of code, if we were to try to run this now, would fail was our controller. Because again, a lot of this is Umbra Code 8 specific. Um, so we have, um, it's a good thing I did some of these blocks, otherwise we'd be here all night. So this is Umbraco 8 specific from about there down. So I'm just going to wrap that. Five O or greater. Okay. Now, um, the other change here is we, I'm not going to worry about the authorization. Um, we need to re-implement this. So this one's Umbraco. This one should be fine, but we actually need to include it here. In fact, i put that in the wrong spot. So, using, and again, it needs to come down and using, and this is where things get interesting. So I'm just gonna do a copy paste and I might need to adjust some things. All right, magic. All I have to do is fix this up. We don't need these. Um, need some of this. Make sure it's going in the right spot. I just did this, it'll be faster. And All right, we don't need that. What have we got here? Okay, so I can clear out a lot of this stuff as well, most likely. So a lot of that isn't actually relevant. Actually.
we'll just uh, construct a, oh, well, that's one way to do it, but it's not really the right one. Anyway, you get the gist of it. So um, once this is all up and running, then um, we would basically have our, our controller that dual targets. So um, because Umbroco 9 is doing NuGet packages only, we tend to um, fill in all our NuGet package stuff in here, uh, produce a package during build, for example, fill it all in, give it a file version, which can be done up here, um, further down, whatever. So, uh, but the, just a note on this build here, what this is doing is it installs this targets file into the project that you're installing the NuGet package in. And this works for Umbroco 8 as well as Umbroco 9. And when you build the project, it'll automatically copy over your app plugins directory into the, into the target project. So um, that's basically a nice little thing to have. Um, it stops you having to worry about uh, copying files or things like that, or refreshing files necessarily. It pretty much does it every time you build it. Okay, I'm done. Um, do you have time for questions? What do you want to do? Uh, we, we will come back to the questions, I guess, uh, after everybody. And yeah, so if you've got anything, just keep it in your, write, write it down and keep it and we'll come back uh, since I think we might have a bit of time at the end. So I'd like to ask Sasha to go next. Uh, want to share your screen? Yeah, I can't share yet. But... Oh, so let me stop. There yeah. you go. All right. Share screen. Okay, let's share the screen. Share. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Hold on, let me just move your faces out of the way so I can read my notes. Okay, um, so my talk is just about starter kits, um, particularly the one that we've been focusing on, which is Uskind. Um, so first of all, I, I when I, in one of the earlier user groups, I asked whether people had used Uskind or, or starter kits in general, I think, and the answer was most people had not, which was a little bit of a surprise because um, they, well, at least Uskind is pretty awesome. So um, you can obviously just install it from here um, or, and as well as actually not, so Igloo is here. Um, Uskind is here and obviously the Umbraca one. The other, the other ones I'm not so sure about. I think they're quite, they're quite simple. So what's, so if we kind of, I'm going to end with, I'll, I'll start with the other ones first and build my way up, way up to Uskind. So there's, there's another one that isn't there, but it's called Amplify. Have you guys ever seen any of these before? Amplify? No? Okay. So I mean, what, what these things do, so everything you see here is built by the, um, built by, um, yep, is built by um, the, the, the um, site builder. So if we look down the screen, essentially each one of these things are, are widgets and you can use them as building blocks on top of Umbraco. And essentially what they what it does is it turns your site into more of a um, ready to go site builder. So, you know, things like these cards um, and e-commerce even and these video players and all this. So essentially you could have this up and running and you can see uh, you, you get a menu like this. If you go to different pages, you'll get um, this, you'll get a contact form such as this. Um, and also, you know, many different widgets. So if we were to look at, for example, just a, a simple accordion widget, you get all these widgets out of the, out of the box. So I don't know, most, I don't know, some of you are from agencies. So if you work in an agency, often you, um, you know, you obviously don't want to rewrite code um, every time, you know, for the same things, every time you do a new project. So you often end up setting up, a, you know, a boilerplate or a white label that you then reuse. So we've done that in the past. And then what happens, they become a bit out of date because they don't keep up with the latest versions of the CMS. If people don't update them all, as you build new widgets, they don't always get pulled um, back into the, to the master project. 
and so so things get lost. Um, when you buy one of these packages, the the good thing is that these um, vendors keep them up to date. So Amplify actually looks quite funky. We haven't used Amplify. I can't really speak to it. I, the only thing I can tell you is that um, the front end is on Vue. Um, so if you want to, so if you if you're a Vue JS company, um, you in fact here here's, here it is. Um, it give, they give you all the front end components included in this case, um, and it's just a, it's a it. In fact, what what sort of um, Damien was and I were talking earlier, and one of the things that sort of um, really shone a light on how useful this stuff is is that one of the pages that um, he had asked one of our front end guys about putting together, um, the front end guy came back and said, "Look, I probably need a couple of days for it." Whereas Damien, even Damien, who's not a coder, could go, could go in and have built the page that he was looking for himself if just with one of these tools. So, and I'll show you what I mean, because I'll show you what Damien actually did in a second. But um, this is Igloo. Do you guys know Igloo? Yeah, have you used Igloo? Because Igloo, I believe, and I'm, don't quote me on, I haven't done the research, but I, I believe that Igloo is actually what they're using on Umbraco Uno. So if you buy, if you, so if you know Uno, is, you're nodding in your head in, that it's true. Yeah, yeah, that's what we've heard as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially, if you've used Duno, has anyone used Duno? A little bit, uh, yeah, sample sites. Okay, yeah, so if you use Uno, then you will have used essentially um, one of these, one of these um, the, uh, site builders. And just to show you like what, an example of a site, if I click on Kaching, you can see a site that was built using, um, so this is just a sample site that was built on well, obviously it's in another language um but you can see this site was put together um using the uno um also the glue in this case i mean everything you see here possibly required zero coding that's something i probably haven't said strong enough um so even if you so you can say so we did a project recently and we were able to set it up and prototype the whole site within a couple of days. Um, and we had done similar sites before, which had taken weeks. And so even if the client comes back and says, yeah, I want to change this, that we actually didn't even, we didn't even need to wireframe or, or even go through a design process. We kind of told them what we we're doing. So we said, look, it could fall on its face. You might hate it, in which case we'll do, we'll go back to the old process. But we were actually able to build the site in a couple of days. So anyway, so Umbraco Uno, um, now onto Uskind. So Uskind is the one that we have been experimenting with and using um, using quite a bit. Now um, it, it's it's in two bits. So basically, you've got a site builder and you've got um, and you've got what's called themes. Once you install the site builder, you essentially can then add the themes on top of it. Um, so it, the easiest thing to actually I'm just going to hit play on the video. You probably won't get the sound, which is fine. But just to, just and I'll talk you through what's happening. But it even has like a front a front end. That's the sounds not coming through, right? It is. It is. Yeah. It is coming through. Yeah. Okay. It's just music anyway. But this gives you an idea of the. You see, the change in the menu. Those are all the menu. Those are all the menus you get out of the box. So you can see, clicking away. Change the header. So should it be sticky or not sticky? Make it, then he's going to make it transparent. And so now the header is transparent. Then even, I mean, you literally can change the, the, the padding, the fonts, the colors, the styles. You can import Google fonts on it. Um, like, it like it's super, super powerful. So I, I, I guess in a way it's, it brings it closer to something like a Squarespace. Um, but it's on Umbraco. So it means on top of, so the, obviously the limitations of something like a Squarespace is you can't customize any further afterwards. But the amount of detail in this thing is ridiculous. Um, so hold on, this video is about to finish at some point. You can see, yeah, so they're changing the underlining styles. And yeah, I just want to finish it. Although you'll probably be out of time by such two minutes. So just 
I'll, I'll jump out of that just to show you um, what I'll show. What I'll show you is what it looks like. Um, we, we built a site. So this is this site. Even though I'm not thrilled with it in its final, because I think the client actually destroyed destroyed it. Um, we this was the site that we basically. It's a. It's actually similar to not. It's the, the branding is also terrible, so it's a little bit ugly. But the but we were able to put it together in a, in a, in a couple of days. Um, it actually looked a lot nicer when we did it originally, um, but I wish, unfortunately, we, we then had to let the client advise us what, what, how they wanted to make us, to make adjustments, but still lit literally, and, and no coding as well. This was all actually just done by the designer. Um, speaking of which, so one of the things that Damien, and part of the reason he's here was because um, we were going to move our website, which is on well, on a headless CMS, coder.com.au. So I'm, I'm just going to show you. Uh, I'm not happy with the headless with the headless CMS that it's on. It's actually really hard to. Um, actually, I'll go to projects. It's really hard to. Whenever I need to make updates, it's a real pain in the butt. So this is kind of like what it looks like at the moment. And Damien on his own, he is like literally. If I hit refresh, literally no developer has put this site together. So this, is, this will be our new website eventually. But as you can see, was the animations for the, you can control the animations, you can control, um, I don't know what else you can, you can control, I'll show you what you can control in a sec, but all, but all of this stuff, Damien was able to do on his own. And it comes with, it even comes with, um, it comes with Umbraco forms as well, built into it. Um, and just to quickly give you, I know we're going to run out of time, so I'm just going to quickly, quickly give you um, a quick look at the back end. So when you go into the back end, it adds a few things to the site. So, I, I, and forgive me if I get confused what was part of original and Braco and what's part of view scans. I'll, I'll just be a couple more minutes. Um, but I, all, all this recent activity stuff, that's not actually out of the box with Braco, is it? This stuff, this stuff here on the right, correct? Okay. I don't think so. No, so it's kind of, so it gives you, so that's kind of a nice little thing that it gives you there, but also, so if we go to global, you've got global settings and it, it predefines for you for things like the navigation, which I think this is a really, really cool way of doing the nav. So you can see the main navigation here, the secondary, well, there is no secondary, but the footer navigation, you can add icons and obviously a hierarchy for there. You can you can create a navigation for when people are logged in. Um, so that's just that's just the navigation part of the global. Um, if we if we go to general settings in global, um, so it, it just adds all these things that you we should be doing anyway to all our sites. So you know the sharing the sharing icons. Um, the Twitter username, et cetera, adding your Google Analytics scripts, your Facebook Pixel, so it's all built in. You can add, you can add e-commerce straight into it. Um, with, they're actually adding vendor, they're working on vendor as we speak. It can, you can add scripts and things to it as well. I'm not sure what notification, oh, notification, oh, don't worry about it. Um, the styling on design um, is this is actually where you can set up your style, um, your CSS basically, but you do it visually. So if we look at, I mean, this, thing, this thing's out of control, crazy, but just give it a sec to load. Um, so in the site header, you can see, um, you can, I'm not gonna play with it, but I, you saw before I can just change all the menu navigations. I can see what it looks like when the drop down. so you can see the drop down opening and closing, I get a preview. Um, you can say, should the header be sticky? What does it look like on mobile? You can change icons, navigation, and I'll just quickly, I'll do, I say also it gives you a rob it gives you a robots.txt file editor built into it. I also don't think that's part of, um, normal out of the box on Braco, um, but it gives you an editor in here and a site map and the site map tool, but just one, sorry, one last bit. <laughs> is that here's just a, a normal page. You can pick, do I want a left column, right column, center, et cetera. But with each of the widgets on the page, and obviously if I click add content, it gives me all the potential widgets. And as, as you can see, there's quite a lot of them. But if I just pick one, for example, if I pick the homepage banner, which is a carousel, 
I can go into the homepage banner. I've got three items in the carousel. If I go to the overall settings for the carousel, I can say how, how do I want them to rotate? Um, you know, do I want drop shadows on them? But, but then on each individual one as well, if I go into the top, the first banner, I can specify, I can, I can upload straight to YouTube. I can have a YouTube background and a Vimeo background or upload a video, put the text that goes over, or I can just have an image and pick the focal point on it, obviously. Um, and the, the style of that, of that particular banner, should it go full screen? Should it just take part of the screen, left align the text? Do I want to animate, animate slowly, quickly, which animation do I want? You get, the, I mean, there's, yeah, I can spend obviously much more time because every widget, it comes with a whole bunch of widgets. Um, I'll just show one more, which is the, um, maybe the split component, which just kind of, give, kind of gives you a left component and a right component. And on the left, in this case, I've got a gallery. Um, and if I look at the gallery, I can say, at the moment, I've only got a single image, but I could, if I went to the settings of it, I could say, do I want, do I want that image on the left to be a carousel in itself? Do I want to show multiple images? Should it be a square? Should it be animated? You can just completely build this thing um, and, and keep, ex and we're working on extending and adding, adding more features to it, but you literally um, can build, as you can see, as Damien did here, he hasn't done the homepage yet, but every other, so he's done the projects, he's done the services page. He, I mean, all, all the stuff which mimics our website, our current website, he built all of this stuff without a developer. Um, so potential is huge, and but it's bug-free, it loads super quick. Um, and it means that if I wanna go in and add new content later, it's really easy to add content. Um, and it also, and just, it also works on, um, on Umbraco Cloud. And it also comes with, I just met my notes here, just it comes with all these integrations already built into it, Google Recapture, where you can set up the, you can set up the form, the subscription form to go straight to MailChimp, campaign, it's out of the box already. You just tell it to, discuss, YouTube, it's got an Instagram feed. Anyway. That's, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Asha. Uh, that, that was really interesting. And uh, I learned quite a few things. I've got some questions, but I'm going to keep that to the end. And yep, sure. others as well, uh, if there's got anything. I'm going to just uh, looking at time and making sure that we manage to finish everything. Uh, Mario, over to you, uh, ground to cloud. All right, thank you. Em. Thank you, Sasha. I don't know why everybody wants to get rid of the developers anyway, but that's another. <laughs> Too expensive. <laughs> Too expensive. We have to eat, man. Um, I have to share my screen. Uh, here we go. Sasha might need to stop sharing. All right. Sorry. No, it's okay. I have the power. All right. You think? <laughs> Can you yeah, see yeah. the. Yeah. Yep. Can you see? Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, I wanted to show today some project that have been working on the past few, two or three months. And it's basically a migration uh, of an Umbraco 7 site from on-premises uh, servers to, uh, to Azure. Um, something that it should be kind of a straightforward. It is, uh, uh, this is not, never going to be straightforward, but you know, I, Kind of easy. Uh, I found a few issues on the way that I wanted to share with you. Um, first, I'm gonna show how the the architecture was before uh, getting the project. Um, so this the uh, this was set up on the on premises servers. So first thing we can see here, there was this gateway uh, uh, that. Um, routed the traffic between different apps. One of them was the, the Umbraco uh, website that you can see on the, the left side here. The rest were uh, applications that the, the client has responding to, to different addresses. This is just an example. They are not in these addresses, but something similar. So the point here is that the website was, wasn't actually on, uh, well, it's still not actually on the root of the site. Um, this responding on this slash uh, forward slash web. Um, also, we can see here that uh, it had different 
different environments. Um, in this case, development UAT and production. The, um, the specific or the, the, the custom thing here that the, the, the client had in, uh, had in place was that um, they had uh, two different um, environment for each instance, really. So two for development, UAT, and two for production. And the reason for that was like they used uh, the staging environment. I was actually replying on this 91 uh, port. They made changes to the content here. And once the, con the changes were approved, uh, they used courier to copy the, um, the content across to, to the actual live site or production. Um, they all, they, I mean, they call them live or production, but instead in this case, for example, it's still in the development side of things, just to keep a copy of uh, production. So they could test that everything works as expected. Uh, for those that don't know what career is, it's just um, a tool uh, made for the Umbraco guys, by the Umbraco guys to copy content between uh, environments. So this uh, basically we moved from that uh, to this configuration in Azure. Uh, we are still we are still keeping the staging and production to because it's a requirement for the client that they have to still record those uh, uh, content transactions into into an external database. Uh, this QA side is just uh, a temporary site that they created. Um, but we are going to remove in the future. Um, so basically we are keeping development and UAT in just um, separate environments without having this um, 91, 92 ports there. What you can see here is that we still have um, a back office and a public that they didn't have before. So the sites were just single sites. Uh, in this case, we are moving to a load balance setup. That's why back office and public. Uh, so this is the infrastructure in Azure. Um, here you, can, you still can see the interaction between the different uh, instances. So we are keeping the current transaction to, um, to copy, to copy the, the content across environments. Here on the right, you can see that between UAT and staging, there is no courier just to keep um, uh, the site secure really. So no testing content goes through, through this pipeline. Um, and you can see some external resources and WCF gear. So this w WCF is what Courier was using to record the transactions in external database. So basically to do the movement, there were just a few things, a broad requirements uh, on this uh, uh, movement really. It was like they had to create to create new pipelines on the DevOps, the client it does, the client had, that's actually an important uh, point, the client had has their own uh, developers and DevOps. Uh, so they uh, set up the pipelines on, on uh, DevOps using ARM templates, uh, just very powerful, but yeah, really complicated actually. Um, but yeah, they were really cool. Then they had, they are going to use uh, Azure storage, so I'd, so far, the site has been using the media folder. Uh, so we're moving the media to the Azure storage. Uh, it's moving from one uh, site to a load balance site. Things we have to keep is, was the query integration I talked uh, talk about before. Uh, one external application integration. So uh, you can see here these external resources. One of the external resources is actually the top menu of the site. So this is something, it was something, sorry, kind of strange. So the, uh, the client is generating the top menu uh, externally to the site because the, the top menu is shared between Umbraco and these different applications. So they went through that path of creating external XML files. And as I said before, the site was running on forward slash uh, web. So we, have, we had to keep that because external tools uh, kept the reference to Umbraco on that uh, address. So we couldn't get rid of that. So uh, because we couldn't, re uh, I, I wanted to remove some of that customization the client did uh, uh, to approach this forward slash as I had to keep it. 
I, I removed and they had a lot of uh, hard coded. So they had hard coded this forward slash address in a lot of places in the code. So I removed all those um, and I used the host names uh, and culture configuration on Umbraco. Um, another thing was, well, I, yeah, I already talked about this top menu being generated. In the future, we want to create uh, that top menu in Umbraco and um, probably uh, expose this top menu on, on an API instead. They are actually using, they're manually configuring, uh, editing these XML files, which is a lot of work. If they just want to use to, to add a new option to the menu, they have to go to these files. They have a custom uh, member manager that connects to uh, Active Directory. So again, they use a very customized um, uh, implementation instead of using the, um, forgetting the name of the package. Anyway, there's a package to do, to do this that you can, uh, you can use to, to connect to your Active Directory account. They haven't used that. Uh, the stage in production, uh, this configuration, weird configuration, uh, instead moving uh, content with courier across instances, they were they had this doubling up of, of environments. Uh, and one thing we realized uh, very late on the uh, on this project is like courier is actually pretty old and doesn't support Azure storage. The reason for that is, well, I don't know if that, there's not a reason, <laughs> but um, it doesn't use the, the media um, provider of Umbraco. It actually copies all the images to the media folder. Doesn't matter. It just, just yeah, it's kind of hard coded somewhere. Um, so uh, to fix this, um, there's I found something on the Umbraco forums that helped me to uh, basically to create a, an event uh, handler uh, to move the the images from the media folder to the Azure storage. So still, uh, once we did the deployment with, you know, keeping a few things, changing all the things, still uh, the site uh, blow up a couple of times. Uh, once was because the client to keep uh, production secure, they removed some, um, some users uh, manually from the database um which they shouldn't so what happened is like when uh, if if a page was created on courier with courier sorry if a page was created on a staging once they were it was copied across by courier courier couldn't find the user on production so it basically broke the page um another thing was that um, the client didn't as i say they had their own uh, devops engineers and developers um, somehow uh, the communication didn't go through internally, and so when I scale out the master application, that created some uh, a lot of issues with the uh, cache being replicated. So someone hasn't used a uh, load balancing setup before. Basically, you have a public site that can be replicated in case the load is too much for only one machine. So it can be replicated automatically on Azure. So finishing. Um, but master can never be replicated. Otherwise, you get a lot of issues with caching and the site gets really crazy. So uh, I think I found a common pattern and the takeaway of this presentation, I guess, is gonna be is actually pretty simple and is like try don't don't do things that don't the only way if there is an unbreakable way. I think the problem was that. The clients, uh, developers didn't know Umbraco and they tried to hack their way into all the things. So the .NET code was good. It's just that there was an Umbraco way. So for example, you have to use Umbraco services, never touch the database, almost like don't delete the users straight from the database. Just try to use the service, use the back offices you can, you can right? So investigate first, the .NET framework, the .NET way of doing things, and uh, don't hard code. Uh, one of the reasons we can't remove easily this forward slash uh, web is because that address is hard coded everywhere, in Umbraco and their their other applications. So I don't know why they did that, but 
I mean, yeah, don't hurt God's stuff. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. That seems like uh, quite a journey. Uh, I'm glad I was just in the background and had a better, better <laughs> appreciation of what you did now. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to David uh, to talk about, uh, and oh, I've, I've just drawn a blank, but uh, to talk about I making custom content list views. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, David. No worries. So mine's not going to be as flashy as the others. Um, but can you all see my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So just, uh, yeah, this is nothing new or shiny or, or out of the ordinary. Um, there's something I did recently for a client um, and just really changed. Um, <laughs> it ended up being the, the, the thing that the customer uh, liked about the whole, whole thing. Um, so it was worth the effort. Um, so custom list views, um, you've probably seen these two screens. Sorry, sorry, they're a little bit blurry for some reason. Um, but out of the box, Umbraco comes with the two, um, with either the table version or the or the card version. Um, now this is this is to in the content section to show um, all the uh, all the child nodes uh, that's under under a thing. So. Um, in these screenshots, it shows shows the products. Now, um, the one thing uh, that that uh, can be an issue is if you want to show like a, a thumbnail image um, or some other complex type of data that doesn't show up uh, correctly in those list views, um, you can create your own uh, list view. So, I'm going to focus on products, um, and this is straight out of the the starter kit. Uh, the bracket starter kit. Um, and so this is a custom list view that I've created and I'll, I'll show you how I create this. Um, and basically, yeah, so pull it, pulling out the product image, uh, which you can't do by default. Um, we're showing the, the name of the product and we're pulling out the price and, and formatting it nicely um, for, the, for the editor. Um, the, the situation that I had that I did the List views for um, the client was uh, it was an artist um, showing all these works, uh, and then he had different photos of the same work. He wanted to call it the same thing. He didn't know which one was which when he was editing. Um, so to be able to give him the the uh, thumbnail uh, really helped him. Um, now this will work for both eight and uh, yeah eight and nine. Um, uh, this code so it will. Yeah, no multi-targeting or anything like that. Um, we first of all create a, a package up manifest, um, and that basically just tells the back office uh, where we can get our custom CSS um, and our, uh, our our controller, which I'll go through. Um, I also should say at the end of this, I'll give you a link to the final code if anyone's interested in in using some of some of these examples. Um, so what I'm going to show here is just sort of cut down versions. Um, so yeah, so that just uh, just includes our, our controller. Um, then we create the view. So with the view, um, we have the thumbnail um, and and the title and the product. Um, the first thing we need to do, I'll put it on the mouse over here, um, is create our own uh, controller. Um, so I normally start everything with DM for digital momentum. Um, uh, and yeah, we'll need to, to use this in our JavaScript later on, just to link the two. Uh, the next thing we, we've got is the, um, is each, each item. Um, and this, this bit of, uh, uh, this tag here, uh, tells Angular to, to repeat, uh, that div over and over again for each of the items that we have. Um, this next section. Um, we grab, uh, we actually check to see if that item is selected. So when we go through, um, I should have shown you this, when we go through, you can select um, multiple multiple products and you might want to bulk publish or bulk delete or, or something like that. Um, so this just adds the selected class um, uh, if that item selected and puts a blue box around it. Um, we've then got the thumbnail. Um, 
and in here in these curly bracket uh, that pulls out um, the the first photo uh, of the product and we grab the source um, now the source does, we don't have the source by default and we need to do some stuff in the actual javascript um, the controller uh, to grab that out that's there for us um, we have an ng click here so when we click the um, the image um, it toggles that selection on and off um, and toggle item is a is a function in our controller Next, we've got the title, uh, which also has a click go to item, which opens up that item to edit. Um, we use um, uh, the Umbraco icon uh, uh, directive here to show a little tag next to it. Um, and then we pull out uh, either the product name, which is one of the custom properties, um, or we pull back to the name of the actual node. And then under there, we just grab the price and that uh, we pipe that into a currency filter, which adds the dollar sign uh, and the decimal, decimal place, et cetera. Uh, so that's our view. Um, there are some other classes on there which I've stripped out um, the view to make it look nice, um, but that's the, the bulk of it. Um, next, we create the controller. There's a few, few steps here. Um, so this is just a, a very basic controller. Um, uh, all our code goes into, into this function. Um, and this just tells uh, Angular um, or Umbraco um, to load to load this this controller that we've said we've shown in the um, HTML template. Uh, we need to add some code. Uh, the first thing we need to do is go through each of the items in the list and grab the 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 uh, URL to each of the each of the images. Um, so. Yeah, just quickly go through, uh, go through each one, um, just check to make sure there is a photo. Um, we call this function. Uh, media resource is something that Umbraco provides in Angular, excuse me, <coughs> um, where we pass it the media key um, and it gives us back, gives us back uh, the, the link and some other details. And so what we're doing is, is this object that we're passing through here, we're just adding a source to it uh, so that that's what we can get on the front end uh, in our uh, view. Um, we have a very simple select here um, and this will probably be pretty much the same uh, for whatever whatever uh, you do. I'm um, a toggle item, checks if it's selected, uses a, a list view helper um, here to either select or deselect the item uh, and that, that comes out of the box as a bracket. Um, and then the other one is go to item, so that that opens up the item to edit. And yeah, as that same thing, we just uh, that will automatically progress to the next page. Um, now the last thing to hook this all together um, uh, is in the um, uh, in the products document type um, where we set up the list view. Um, we actually need to add. The, any of the fields that we need, um, otherwise it, it's not there for us to, to get. Um, and I had forgotten that at first. Um, so I was wondering why some, some of the fields weren't coming through. Um, so you just got to make sure that you, you add any, any um, of the properties uh, that you need uh, in that setup. And then lastly, um, we add our custom layout, uh, call it whatever we want, pick an icon, um, and then a, um, uh, then the, the relative path to that HTML file that we created. Um, I'll quickly show you a demo. Um, so this, uh, yeah, so this is the product um, product document type. So under list view here, um, we can go to the settings and you can see that we've put, put those extra uh, fields in there. And if we come to the content, and we open up the products. Uh, we can see the, the custom. Um, so we have our defaults, which we're all used to. And you can see here photos comes out um, a little bit little bit weird. Um, and so yeah, so that's why you need to create your own custom view for that. Um, clicking on the on the image highlights them all so you can do usual bulk publish. Um, unpublished, etc. So that was that toggle item function. 
um, and then clicking on the title actually opens up that um, that uh, product. Uh, I'll go back. I think that's pretty pretty much it. Um, just on the on the final slide, uh, there's a few links which I can, I'll put in the chat. Um, I've put together the first one component the examples. Uh, you'll find all the code for what I've just shown you in there. Um, and that's on GitHub. And I'm going to uh, add more and more components to that over time just to share share things out, some useful code and things like that. Um, there's also an Umbraco TV, um, uh, Umbraco TV uh, session on list views. Um, and that's that covers uh, more in depth of, of what I've just been through um, and pretty similar to what I've done. Uh, if you do want to see the demo project, that's also on GitHub um, and then a link to the presentation um, if you want it. And that's me. I did it in 10 minutes. Thanks, David. <laughs> nice on time. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to ask uh, just yeah, aware of time. I'm going to ask Ananda uh, to share his thoughts next on infrastructure and code and peripheral uh, environments. Uh, Ananda, over to you. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, everyone, once again. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank Emmanuel for giving this opportunity to talk uh, in this stage. Uh, it was a nice meeting you all. So without further delay, uh, I will talk about the infrastructure as a code. So, so before infrastructure as a code, uh, earlier what we are doing, uh, yeah, earlier what we are doing, we need to set up the servers. Uh, uh, we need to, uh, if, in order to deploy anything from uh, to the development to the production uh, uh, with uh, several environment like staging, QA, and production, pre-production, and production environment, we need to uh, we need to set up servers, VMs. Uh, and also network setup like VPC, subnet, and routes, um, the load balancer, and and we need to install in each environment. We need to install the application softwares and DB installation. So it it's all uh, requires some manual effort actually. So if it is a small environment, it is a, a small uh, environments like a limited number of servers. It is well and good. We can manage it with the manual resource. But when we are going for enterprise uh, uh, sections, like enterprise uh, uh, industries, where we have uh, several uh, n number of more than uh, 50 plus uh, servers. So in this case, uh, if we do go for a manual, so we need to have a separate infrastructure team. It requires more efforts and time to deploy each and every steps and there is a chance of uh, uh, human error which can occur uh, for involving in these steps actually, and also high maintenance. So, so in order to do everything manually, so we need to uh, we are uh, having several tools in the market, uh, like like Ansible, uh, Terraform, Puppet, and Chef. So using, using this tool, we can able to achieve this infrastructure as a code. Infrastructure as a code is just a concept of automating all these tasks from end to end. That is from creating the infrastructure till uh, managing the infrastructure, uh, including the applications as well. So each tool has its own roles and responsibilities. So it's up to our, uh, our uh, convenience to use a single tool or multiple tool to have the infrastructure, uh, to achieve this infrastructure as a code. So the main task for the infrastructure as a code is for infrastructure provisioning, like creating the server, spinning up, uh, and uh, uh, installing the software configurations, uh, et cetera. Uh, and also we need to deploy the application. So, before uh, Docker coming into the picture, we need to do the software configuration and the application uh, deployment uh, will be uh, two separate tasks. So now we can merge this software configuration and the deployment application uh, can be say, merged into a single task and we can uh, deploy it as a container, which can, the, it contains the all inbuilt software for that application to run. 
so we 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 have done this initial setup what we will be doing the next thing so we need to do the maintenance of this uh, servers which we have been uh, rolled out so for maintaining servers we need to we have a, uh, we have to update the configuration we we there is a possibility of scaling up and scaling down uh, and updating the patch so with this infrastructure code so we can easily come into picture instead of manual effort with the tool we can able to achieve this uh, this this okay so as i said it before this each tool has its own uh, roles and responsibility for example if you want if you are using a terraform we can create infrastructure uh, setup and maintain the setup and also we can deploy the application uh, but it can't able to maintain the application but in ansible we can't able to create the infrastructure but it can uh, maintain the infrastructure and also it will maintain the applications so so in the market people will use both the uh, both the tools to uh, achieve this end to end task so there are so many approaches uh, to do this automation so uh, first thing is uh, imperative approaches and and declarative approaches so imperative approaches is nothing but uh, for each and every steps we need to write uh, we need to call use the cloud uh, command line interface for creating a server spinning up the server for speed, doing the vpc uh, and uh, doing creating the load balancer so everything will be in a command line interface so there is a problem with this imperative approaches even though if it is a very well uh, process for following step by step so in case of any kind of mistake happen it is uh, difficult for us to uh, tear down back to the um, where exactly the problem occurred and we need to roll back all those things but in declarative approach we will say this to we will command will give a command to the tool that we want to have this specific uh, uh, this specific task which needs to be done so so the rest we will provide only the configuration to the tool so the tool will take care of what is the end achievement for this process for example if i want two vms i can just add the configuration and then if i run the tool then it will create the two vms for you so as if as like we need to do the same kind of uh, end events defined as a declarative approach so as per the as per the uh, standard people are mostly following this declarative approach and the other thing is mutable and immutable servers so if it is a immutable server we can't change any kind of configurations or uh, or uh, any kind of uh, any kind of software upgrades but in mutable we can do that uh, so using this so using this uh, uh, terraform tool Uh, we can able to uh, achieve this both the process but it is best option to use the uh, immutable uh, scenario where we uh, where if you want if you have more than uh, 10 or 20 servers in case uh, in the example if you want to add one database update script in that one of the server and if you want to uh, implement the same thing across all server so it will be a little bit of confusing for the uh, for the developer to achieve this so what is in the immutable version so we will create a typical copy of the exact production and we will implement the the script in the uh, product uh, duplicate copy of the production and we will discard this one so in this case so the configuration and the en uh, environment setup everything will be uh, not um, Ma not uh, modified so it will be more safer for you to achieve this uh, thing so best approach for going forward with the uh, infrastructure as a code is declarative approach and immutable uh, approach 
So I'll talk about a little bit on Terraform, how this tool has been working out. So this tool is working uh, based on two things. One is uh, Terraform configuration, another one is uh, with the state. So from the Terraform core, uh, it, will, it will listen to this Terraform configuration and the state of the configuration. If it is a new one or a existing configuration has been modified, so based on the state, it will just uh, check the definition in the configuration and from the current state to the desired state, it will execute. So we can use the several providers like AWS, Azure, Kubernetes, um, and we can uh, spin up the VMs, PaaS, SaaS. So using these providers, we can able to, uh, this Terraform can talk to the providers and it will provide you a simple uh, spinning of VM. So no need the, for the developer to log in into the portal.azure.com or uh, AWS portal to do the all this um, uh, for upgrading the updating the IP address uh, for any any kind of things. No need to log in. Everything will be done through the tools. So these are all the sample codes uh, uh, which which I got. So in the first thing, you can able to see where we are our uh, Azure, uh, where the, where this is set uh, Terraform, where this Terraform is available in the Azure resources and what is the current version and what are the, what are the features? Um, example, we are creating a resource. This is the resource name, which location we need to create and VNet, what is the VNet? What is the, what is the VNet config? This is VNet configuration and uh, in and subnet configuration, uh, app service for the front end, uh, and then app service for the back end, back end, back end web app. So, so with this, uh, uh, with this specific code, once we uh, run this tool with by connecting with the Azure uh, Azure or AWS API, it will it will just provide you the end uh, definition whatever you are uh, trying to add it in the tool. So this will reduce the manual effort. Um, so uh, without any confusion or something, we can uh, use this infrastructure as a code going forward. Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you all. Thanks, Ananda. That was uh, very useful. Uh, and that's something which we have not uh, uh, touched a lot on, on sort of uh, Umbraco side of things. and. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I know we've just gone a bit over, so it's uh, 7.34, but if you've got time uh, and if you've got questions, please, uh, yeah, 